thankful that you would fill this place. We're thankful that you would touch our hearts. We're thankful for your voice. We ask that you would show us your ways that we may walk in them. That you would show us your glory. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, and we're going to read through verse 1 to ver we'll just read the whole chapter. The presence of God is in this place. If you don't feel it, your feeler is broken. Isaiah 61, this is speaking of Jesus. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives in the opening of prison doors to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn to grant those who mourn in Zion to give them a beautiful headdress what do you say beautiful headdress, beautiful headdress. instead of ashes the oil of gladness, the oil of joy, instead of mourning, the garment of praise, instead of a faint spirit, your translation may say a spirit of heaviness, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall tend to your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers. But you shall be called the priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy, for I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations, their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them that they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. For He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robes of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, as a garden causes what, it's, what is sown to sprout up, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. This scripture is speaking of Jesus. If you don't understand, when we understand that Jesus is the Messiah, 
The definition of Messiah is literally the anointed one. The anointed one. There is no such thing as a double portion of the anointing. I know we look in 2 Kings 2 and where Elijah asked Elijah for a double portion of his spirit. It's a lowercase s. You cannot have a double portion of the anointing because there's only one anointing. Right. It's not the anointing of the evangelist or the apostle. It's the anointing of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Because he is the anointed one. Right. And when we step into him, we receive participation into the anointing that he has. When we receive participation in the anointing that he has, he pinpoints for us a direct place, or sometimes he just gives us a plethora of things, but there's always a way that that oil, that anointing will flow through us. So the, the anointing is the authority of heaven, the oil of heaven that is placed on something symbolizing that it was sent from God. Yeah. Symbolizing that God, all of heaven, is backed behind whatever that oil is upon. That that is a vessel from God. So Jesus, being the anointed one, you have to understand that we are not here and Jesus is here. Right. He made it to where he came down here, delivered himself to here, so that he could resurrect you to be seated with him. Amen. Amen. Okay? <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. Actually, we'll read... Verse 1 through 6. Bear with me here. We're following the Spirit. Amen? Amen. Can we do that? Yeah. yeah. And you were once dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Who are the sons of disobedience? Those who do not follow Christ among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, He made us alive together with Christ. It is by grace you have been saved. And raised us up with Him, and seated us. Everybody say me. me. Seated us with Him. In heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace. And kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. We have been co-crucified with Christ. We have been co-raised with Christ, Amen. we have been co-seated with Christ. Okay. Yes, Lord. Co-crucified. You participated in His crucifixion. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, uh, For all one has died, and once and for all, therefore all have died. Because of the crucifixion of Jesus, you, when you step into Him, have been crucified with Him. That means that when the nail was driven through His hands, the nail was driven also through your hands. Because on the cross, He carried you. That means spiritually, we participate with Him in His crucifixion. That's why the Apostle Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of Jesus Christ. There comes a place in God where you so enter into who He is that you know the power of His resurrection and you fellowship with His suffering. That's what Paul said at the end of his life. He said, I desire only 
one thing that I might know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. The only way to know the power of his resurrection is to fellowship in his suffering. The, the suffering of Christ is the crucifixion of Christ. Romans chapter 6 tells us that we are to be buried with Christ in the waters of crucifixion. That we have been baptized into His crucifixion. And if we have been baptized into His crucifixion, we have also been raised out of those waters in resurrection. We are... Buried with Him, we've been raised with Him. We haven't just been buried with Him. When we are raised with Him, we were seated with Him. Where He is seated. Which means that you do not live as a part of this world. Amen. Don't just hear that as church language. Because we've all heard, well, we're in this world, but we're not of it. Uh, but most of us are in it and of it. When situations take place that infect, affect you, you get, you get down on yourself. You feel broken. You feel depressed. You feel anxious. The reason why is because you live as one who is of the world. Yes. You have, to, you have to awaken to that truth if you want to go further than that. If you want to break out the being of the world, you have to recognize first that you are of the world. You are not called to live of the world, but if you are impacted by worldly cares, by worldly situations, and it determines the climate of your spiritual life, then you are of this world. If situations determine your prayer life, your faithfulness to church, your faithfulness to Christ, your lifestyle in God, then you do not yet possess the revelation, the understanding that you are not of this world. Amen. When we step into Him, it's a dimension. If you... Look in the Bible, you will find two words all throughout the New Testament. In Him. Yes. In Him. If there is something in you that's not in Him, you are not in Him. But Jesus made a way on the cross through His blood that we could live, move, and have our being in Him. Have our being, not our doing. Our being. Right. Your being is a state of rest. You ever just sit down and you just be? Yeah. He said we we don't just have our doing in Him because then it would be for works. We have our being in Him. That every breath you take is in Him. Every step you make is in Him. Every move, every word, every glance at a person is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's a reality that we don't really understand in the church. We think Jesus is somewhere else and we have a little bit of Him in us. But if He lives in you, He lives through you. If He lives in you, the sick will be healed. If He lives in you, the broken will be restored, the bound will be set free, the captives will be delivered, if He lives in you. We've watered down what it means to be born again to just simply repeating an unbiblical prayer at the altar. In the... In, in the early 1900s, late 1800s, there was great revivalists. And they would say this of their revival meetings. They would say, we had a thousand people prayerfully converted. Prayerfully.
fully converted. We don't use that term anymore because we think everybody is saved. Wow. They said we had this many people prayerfully converted. What were they saying? They were saying, yeah, they responded to the gospel, but we don't know whether or not it actually took root in them. And uh, our churches are full of people that have prayed a prayer, but never borne any kind of spiritual fruit that testifies of a born-again encounter with God. Right. When somebody is born again, you can see it in their eyes. When somebody is born again, you can see it through the way they walk. When somebody is born of the Spirit of God, there's it's different. Their countenance is different. They view things different. Their perspective has changed. It's not that they're perfect. They just have the DNA of God in them. They have... Yeah. Separation. It's the only separation. 
If you are in Christ, you have the same anointing that your pastor has. You have the same anointing that your favorite preacher has. You have the same anointing. You don't need them to lay hands on you to receive their anointing. You need to get a prayer line. Yes. You have been raised with Him, seated with Him, above principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, dominions, and authorities in the heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 1. Paul is praying to the church of Ephesus in verse 17 through 22. He says, And I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your understanding enlightened. What do you, does your heart's eyes need to be enlightened for? To understand what you already possess. I want you to hear that and believe that. That your eyes must be open to what Jesus has already given to you. That you may know what is the hope to which He called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power towards us who believe, according to the working of His great might that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead, listen closely, and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. He put all things under His feet and gave Him as head over all things to the church. Hallelujah. This scripture testifies that Jesus is seated right now over all rule, authority, power, dominion, and every name that has ever been named. And then where does Ephesians 2 tell you that you are seated? Right there with Him. Which means that you actually have to lower yourself to get into a battle with the enemy. Wow. You actually have to take a step down in order to even be attacked by the devil. That's good. Yeah. I want you to hear me. We are called to live in a realm that the enemy is not even does not even have access to. That's good. That's good. Which means that if we're not living in that place, we are not giving Jesus what He paid for us to have. True. We're actually taking power away from the cross by living a life disobedient to the Word of God. He was not crucified for your sin so that you could struggle with sin for the rest of your life. If if you have to wait to die to be free from sin, death is your Savior and Jesus is not. Freedom from sin is not purchased at your last breath. Freedom from sin was purchased by the precious blood of Jesus. Amen. I get kicked back from people all the time when I say things like this. Because we watered down the work of the cross. Well, brother... We'll always struggle. I'll always have to fight the flesh. Have you heard if you feed uh, one dog, the dog will grow? Anybody raise your hand? Okay, well, if you shoot the dog, it doesn't matter what you put in front of him. He's not going to grow. And, and the Bible does not say that Jesus starved the flesh. It says he crucified the flesh. And it doesn't tell you to stop feeding your flesh and it won't grow, it tells you to crucify your flesh. Amen. And I've never seen anything dead grow by feeding it. You can make the decision to raise it with the power of your faith, though. We place faith in the flesh and that's when it gets its life back. Wow. That's good. Something happens to us, and consciously we have a decision that we can make. 
Can I operate out of flesh that was supposed to be buried in crucifixion? Or can I operate as I am made to operate? And most of the time, people don't understand the perspective in which Jesus purchased. So they reach into the waters of crucifixion and disown the work of the cross by raising their flesh from the dead. If you are going to take off the world's lenses, you have to see with the kingdom lenses. Right. Yes. Or you will be blind. Wow. You will be unsatisfied. This is why I love um, coming into an encounter with people who are addicted to drugs. Because they are naturally designed to be wild about something. I'm serious. They were naturally designed by heaven to have fulfillment in something. And when you pull them out of their addiction, they become radical for God. Yeah. See, we have some. I think the most dangerous thing to the gospel is your average, everyday American citizen. Because they're not radical about anything. At all. And so it takes more to get an average everyday American person on fire for God than it does to take an act, get an addict on fire for God because you rip them out of what was satisfying them and you show them that there's a whole new world that can satisfy them. And they go straight into it. Because they understand that they've been designed to be hungry for something. And each person in this room was made to be hungry yes. for something. Yes. Yeah. Hungry for God. Yeah. Amen. And so you, you have to go to the extreme in the kingdom of God or you will never be satisfied. You won't. You will never be satisfied. You have to be sold out completely radical or else you're not going to understand why you left your pleasing life of sin because you found no pleasure in the presence of God because you're unwilling to surrender what it takes to find pleasure in the presence of God you have to give everything you have to rip the lenses of this earth off and instead of just walking around in the dark saying I'm saved put the lenses of the kingdom of God on so that you begin to see with a new perspective Amen. See, a lot, of, a lot of people have never heard something like this. Because we don't preach the kingdom of God in most churches anymore. Right. We talk about church. And what I'm doing. And what you, you're doing. And your purpose. And what you got going on. And how can I appeal to what you feel. And that's not the kingdom of God. It's how can we appeal to Him and be an appeal to the earth. Amen. And so I would rather a group of 15 people that are full of Him, filled in Him, and walk with Him, than a group of people that want what they want. Wow. Come on. You have to be hungry for God. You have to put on the perspective of heaven, or else you will never see God do anything in your life. Darkness... Light never sees darkness as a battle. Light never sees darkness as intimidation. Light sees darkness as an invitation. That's good. Yeah. Wow. Therefore, born again people of the Spirit see sickness as an invitation for healing. They see broken situations as an invitation to release restoration. They see the things of this world as an invitation. This is the shift we have to make in our mind. The repentance. That we don't see this world and react to the world. We're not called to react to the world. Right. We're called to have a response before they ever have a question. We can't live from earth to heaven. We have to live from heaven to earth. 
We can't, when a situation comes about, we can't get on our knees and ask God to intervene. We have to realize that God has placed everything in us that is necessary to be the intervention for that situation. Evil circumstances are an invitation for you to release the light of the kingdom of God. Amen. Creation gr is groaning. It's always groaning. Even when people hate you, even when people don't want anything to do with you, you have to see past what they're saying with their mouth and understand that on the inside of who they are, they don't like you because they want what you have and they don't understand what you have. You have to see it with different eyes. You have to see it as a disciple and not as Jonathan. Because you think they're attacking you when they speak out against you. But Jesus said they're not attacking you. Right. They're attacking me. Wow. They're rejecting him in you because they don't understand why you're fulfilled and they're not. Wow. And they do, oh, well, you think you're better than me. Sometimes you just have to look at them and say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have joy, so uh, I'm doing a bit better right now. <laughs> like, we have, we got to stop doing this thing like, if you have joy and they don't, then you're doing better. Yeah. And they don't need somebody that's just like them. They need somebody that has something to offer them when they feel like they don't amount to anything. You can't stoop down to their depravity and say, oh, well, you know, I'm the same way if not for Jesus. No, you say, Jesus has transformed me and I have something to give to you. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's so good. Peter and John did not walk past the lame man at the gate beautiful look at him and say, oh, brother, I used to be crippled just like you. Let me tell you what Jesus can do. They said, I don't have silver or gold, but I do have something. Let me give it to you. Get up and walk. You, you don't reach down to the situation. You reach into the situation wow. and pull them out of the situation. Yeah. Come on. Amen. Second Peter 1, verse 3 says that His divine power has granted us all things. Everybody say all, all. things yeah. that pertain to life and godliness. 1-3. 2 Peter 1 3. According to his divine power, he has granted us all things. Yeah. Wanna know what the Greek means in that? No. All. <laughs> Wanna know what the definition of all is? Every part. Yeah. All things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. He said, I pray that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. That you might know. That you might know. And it tells us right there in 2 Peter 1. That through the knowledge of His glory. We, we understand we've been granted all things that pertain to life and godliness. Hear it like this. There is nothing God wants to give you that you do not currently possess. There are many things God wants to reveal to you that He's already put in you. Because you're in Him. You, you are an anointed one because you are in the anointed one. Amen. Is this good? Good. Yeah. You are not of this world. You are seated with Christ in heavenly places and He has given you a co-mission. A co-mission. We missed the CO part there. Who was that that said that this morning? We missed the CO part right there. We think it's our mission. No, it's a co-mission. We go with Him because we're in Him. For Him, by Him, through Him are all things. We go with Him. It's a co-mission. 
And when we walk with him, we see the aspects of the prohibition fulfilled. When we try to go in our own strength, you'll never see the sick healed. You'll never see disciples be made. But when you go with him, understanding that he is right there with you, he is right there in you, he is upon you, then all things pertaining to life and godliness flow through you. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we are called to be filled with the fullness of everything God has to offer somebody. So I don't believe that God has called certain people specific to do one thing. Yeah. I understand, like, for you, your strength is deliverance. That's what God, the, what God has really placed you in. But as sons and daughters of God, we have access to anything someone yes. needs at any moment. Yes. So we have to stop this thing where we're just so fascinated with healing that we never cast demons out. Right. Or we're so fascinated with casting demons out that we never get people saved. Right. Yes. We're called to be filled with the fullness of heaven so that no matter what we come into contact with, we have something to release in the moment. Which means if you have no joy, you need to get joy. If you have no peace, you need to get peace. Because there's people in your life that need what's in you that you don't understand you have. Maybe the reason you're not making the impact in your family or your work is because you are blinded to what God has put in you. The Spirit of the Lord it's upon me. This is Jesus. But if we're in Him, it's upon us. Right. So anytime Scripture speaks of Jesus, it now speaks of us. That's good. Why? Because we're in Him. Yeah. To bring good news to the poor. Mm -hmm. yeah. To someone in poverty, they never dream of having good news. You see, in all of Isaiah 61, there is an exchange of equal opposites. To the poor, you bring good news. To the brokenhearted, you bring healing of the, the whole heart. You have to go to the other extreme. To the brokenhearted man or woman, you cannot try to bring them a halfway healed heart. The anointed one will never do that. Amen. He always takes poverty and brings good news. He always takes broken hearts and he brings whole hearts. You have to be, when you are in the world, you lived extreme for the devil. Anybody else was ever a sinner? <laughs> When you were in the world, you lived in obedience to darkness. You might not have been a level five Satanist or whatever, but you lived in obedience to darkness. Anytime the devil wanted you mad, you got mad. Anytime the enemy wanted you to sin, you sinned. You didn't know any better. You don't, didn't know any different. And if you're going to be that radical for darkness, you have to be more radical for the kingdom of light or you will never be satisfied as a believer. You have to go to the end of the spectrum. You cannot stay in the middle. Look, the Laodicean church, we talked about it last Sunday morning, was deceived because they were lukewarm. They believed that they were rich. They believed that they were in need of nothing. They believed that they were clothed. But the truth about them was, you are blind, wretched, pitiful, poor, and naked. Right. You will always believe something that the reality is you know that you're not when you live a li lukewarm lifestyle. You will always claim joy and walk in depression. You will always claim peace and walk in anxiety. You will always claim peace and be angry. Because what we do is 
And if you are in the middle, you're not on this end, but you're not a completely cold-hearted sinner. You're in the middle. You have a desire for God, but you don't live fully for Him. You put titles on things you don't possess. Wow. Say, this belongs to me. Wow. And that's where we get the, Lord, if it be your will, let this person be healed. Because you don't know that you possess healing on the inside of you. The Lord would, I, I, doing ministry a couple years ago, the Lord would begin to have me say, I release this into this person. And I remember one time somebody asked me, why do you say, I release peace into you? Isn't it God releasing peace into them? And I say, yeah, you're right. And the Lord says, no, you have it. Yeah, yeah. You have it. Yeah. Peter and John, what do they say in Acts chapter 3? Silver and gold, I have none. But what I have. They were in full possession of healing. Amen. And they could release that healing because they understood that they were in possession of it. The enemy wants to convince you that heaven is at a distance and when you pray, you're calling something from miles and miles away to try to get here and it's, you're like throwing up Hail Marys. Right. The kingdom of God teaches you you possess all things pertaining to life and God. Yes. When you step into the knowledge of His glory. When you begin to know His presence, you begin to realize what He's giving you. If you were here this morning, you probably didn't think we were going to give an altar call for, for, for refreshing tonight. Because we were in town. You see, she's like making this little face like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> but we possess all things in a time of intensity. You need intensity. So good. In a time of peace, you need real peace. And you can have both at the same time. Amen. There's been some people... You walk up there in the altar, lay hands on them, and scream fire. The next person you go to, you lay hands on them and cry and hug them. Right. We right. need to be filled with everything he wants to release at any moment. That's good. That's Amen. Good. He says, oh, to proclaim liberty to the captives, opening the prison door to those who are bound. When, when you make these exchanges with Christ, when you step out of poverty into good news, when you step out of a broken heart into a whole heart, when you step out of captivity into liberty, when you step out of prison into freedom, open doors, when you step out of mourning into a beautiful headdress, when you step out of a spirit of heaviness into joy, you begin to become the agent of the same exchange you experienced. You become an ambassador for the anointed. But you cannot try to be an ambassador without first making the exchange. You come to Him, you receive a whole heart. Now you have a whole heart to give. Right. But a lot of times we try to give a whole heart while ours is still broken. We try to give joy while we're still walking around in heaviness. We try to give freedom while there's still a little bit of bondage in us. And we don't see the power available in the anointing because we don't possess what the anointing has given us. Y'all following me? So you have to come to the anointed one and allow him to bring good news to the areas of poverty in your life. You have to come to the anointed one and allow him to bring a whole heart to the areas of brokenness in your life. You have to come to the anointed one and allow him to open the doors and bring freedom in the areas where there is bondage. Right. You have to come to him and let him bring you joy. If you don't know whether or not you have joy, let me help you. You don't have joy. It's just the truth. You cannot, let me, let me break down the worldly concept real quick. You cannot wake up in the morning and choose joy. You cannot wake up in the morning and choose peace. That's a lukewarm lifestyle. 
I'm going to walk in depression, but I'm going to keep saying that I have peace. No, you're deceived. People say, oh, you just have to pick this. You have to say that you have it. You have to name it and claim it, and you got it. It's not how it works. You have to claim it before you can name it. You start laughing and realize, oh, joy, that's what that is. I don't understand why everything is okay. Oh, well, Scripture tells me to have peace that surpasses understanding. That's what that is. It has to be in your possession, then you'll understand what you have. So if you can't choose it, then what do you do? You abide in the anointed one. He says, if you abide in me, I will abide in you, and you will bear much fruit. So you can't choose joy or choose peace. Because you'll settle for a false peace. You have to choose Jesus. Come on. Amen. You have to abide in Him, walk in Him, dwell yes. in Him. And peace and joy and love and faithfulness and fruitfulness will flow out of your life. Yes. That's it. You cannot strive for fruit. You have to yield to the power in the vine. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You cannot work for fruit. You cannot work on being patient. You just can't. It would. It would be doing it in your own strength. And what will end up happening is you will think you're rich, you needed nothing, clothed, and the Lord will say, no, you're actually wretched, poor, pitiful, blind, and naked. Like, no, you don't have peace. You just say you have peace. But He sees you. He sees you when you're not at church. He sees you when you're at home with your own thoughts. He sees you. You cannot try to convince God of something you are not. He sees you. And I don't even, like you can pretend and not respond to the altar call. I don't care. I just want you to know, he's, well I do care. But I want you to know, he sees you. You can, you can hide from me. You can hide from everybody in this building. You can hide from your friends and your family members. But He will see you. And He will be there. Just got real in here. He sees you. You're, the person in here, they ask you how you're doing. Oh, I'm good. But you have a broken heart and He knows that. You might be unwilling to admit it, but you're just lying to yourself. If in every situation you expect the worst, you are hopeless. You have ashes instead of beauty. And what Jesus wants to do in his place is crucify the pretender in you. And raise to life the real person that he designed you as. The moment you step into that reality, you will come into the light and all of it will fade away. He wants to crucify the deception, the illusion that you have a whole heart when the truth in the depths of who you are knows you do not. The illusion that you are free. But there is areas of bondage, whether or not you act on it. Being free from lust is not just simply not watching pornography or acting on your desire. Being free is when the desire is gone. Come on now. Like, hallelujah. <laughs> being, being free is when the desire is gone. It's like rehabs will never set anyone free. Because all it does is restrict them from the narcotics. They still have the desire. They're still bound. Until right. the desire is gone, freedom has not set in. Right. Until you are no longer, until you no longer desire to get back at those who got at you, you're not free. Right. That's just the truth. So good. We, God is looking for someone who will be real with Him in His presence. 
You don't have to come to me and say, oh, brother, well, I struggle with this, this, this. You don't have to tell me all your problems. He is looking for someone who will be real with him. If that involves confession, that's fine. But if not, that, that's fine as well. Like I remember when I was little and I made mistakes, I would ask for forgiveness and I still would not get over I had to tell my parents. They instilled it in me. They imparted it into me when I was a, a baby. Had no choice. That's just how I was. If, so if you have to confess, if you... Let me just be simple. If you keep on repenting of something but still feel convicted, you probably need to tell somebody. Because the truth is your repentance is probably not as genuine as you think it is. Because most people want to go directly to God because they're too prideful to let anybody else around them. And God will, have, God will restrict your freedom until you can go to someone in humility and truly be free. I feel the Lord here. Yep. That's, that's exactly what I was thinking. I just didn't want to quote it. Confess your sins to one another and you will be healed. Not God. One another. One of the greatest revivals that ever broke out, um, I'm not going to try to find the name of it, but it was literally where people were gripped with conviction and started confessing sin to people. And a revival breaks out. That is, that is more impressive to me than watching somebody get healed. Is watching someone reveal their heart to people. Because light can only shine through transparency. If light does not flow through your life, it's because you're still hiding. You still have aspects of darkness you don't want anybody to see. And your light cannot shine fully because... You don't want people to see who you really are. Personal, huh? Good news to the poor. Whole heart instead of a broken heart. Freedom instead of captivity. The opening of prison doors. Nobody in prison ever has hope to see the day the door opens. They're hopeless. And so Jesus opens the door and says, here you go. Oil of joy instead of a spirit of heaviness. We need that desperately. You're hard pressed to find people that have joy in our day. Want to, want to have a tip for keeping your joy? Turn off your TV. That's yes. Yes, yes. Turn it off. Don't watch the news. Just have joy. You watch the news, you'll sign up for depression. That is. Like, if the Lord wants me to know, he'll tell me. Right. Oil of joy instead of a spirit of heaviness. A beautiful headdress instead of ashes. Your, your translation might say beauty instead of ashes. The Hebrew literally defines it as a crown of beauty placed on someone's head. A headdress of beauty. Why? Because ashes speak of your perspective. A lot of people see things hopelessly. They see their lost loved ones with no hope. And he says, I'm going to bring a beautiful perspective to you. That, that you step into the truth and revelation that all things work for good to those that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. That is a beautiful headdress. That even negative situations work for your good. What we do, though, is we keep our ashes perspective. And we mourn over the negative things. He said, grant those who mourn in Zion a beautiful headdress instead of their ashes. Actually, it was a picture of the, the crowns that people would wear in that day where it would symbolize uh, if a king had been rightly identified, 
they would place a crown on his head that was that had leaves woven into it. You ever seen like a picture of Caesar or something? They had the leaf in the crown. It's because the if the leaf withered in their crown, it would say this this person is not fit to be king. But if the leaf never withered in their crown, it would be a symbol that they were ordained by God. And they would put sackcloth and ashes on their head when they were mourning. And so he says, instead of your ashes, I'm going to give you something that rightly identifies who you are. I'm going to give you a, a lifestyle that carries authority with life in it that never fades. Amen. A beautiful headdress instead of a uh, instead of ashes. Oil of gladness instead of mourning, praise instead of heaviness. That they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planning of the Lord. Psalms 1 would teach us that blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scoffer. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on it he meditates day and night. He has made himself like a tree. Remember Isaiah, oaks of righteousness. He has made himself like a tree planted beside streams of water. His leaf never withers, and in due season he always bears fruit. In everything that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so. They are like the chaff that the wind drives away. The righteous shall stand in the counsel of God, but the wicked will not be able to stand. In his, in his judgment. It says he, the righteous one is planted beside what flows. If you're here this morning, you should put the pieces together. Hopefully, if not, Lord, touch them. He lives by what flows. He has an eternal reserve of joy. That the world cannot take from him. He has an eternal reserve of love. That the world cannot take from him. And he is always bearing fruit. And his leaf never withers. His fruit is not of the world. Earthly fruit fades. Heavenly fruit is eternal. No matter the situation. You have to understand that you have been connected to joy forevermore. You have been connected to peace that never ends. Amen. Is this helping anybody? Yeah. Yes. We make this exchange, what we have for what he offers, and now we become the ones who can make the exchange with others. When we possess what the anointed one gives us, then we become the anointed one that has things to give. I can pray for someone and see their heart be mended because I know my heart's mended. Right. I can pray for someone and see them set free because I know that I am free. But if there is any doubt in you, you have to get it. If there is any brokenness in you, you have to receive a whole heart. If there is any heaviness in you, you have to receive joy. You have to receive praise. You have to receive what the anointed one, Jesus himself, wants to give in the place of what you currently have. The Lord wants to be personal. I believe I, this is my last service here. Uh, for a while, I guess. I don't know. That's up to Brady, whatever God says. But I, I want, this is why I'm speaking this. Is because if you make the exchange, you become an ambassador of the exchange. Yes. Amen. But you have to, and it's not about you getting it all together. 
It's about you knowing what he has paid for you to possess. And not just knowing it, but possessing it. So if you have a broken heart, tonight, Jesus wants to give you a hold. Amen. If you walk in bondage, tonight, he wants to set you completely free. Amen. If you have ashes, he wants to give you a beautiful perspective. Amen. It's not a shameful thing. He's here to make an exchange with you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is the last scripture of the night, I think. That's a big I think. If you've ever heard me preach, no call me a look. Verse 11, we're going to read verse through 21. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is also known to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. What is he saying? Not about what is real. Not about what is true. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Anybody say amen. amen. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard Him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Amen. This is you. You have to be reconciled to him if you want to be a reconciler. Therefore, wait, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him, and entrusting to us. The message of reconciliation. Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For our sake. He made him to be sin. Who knew no sin. So that in him. We might become. The righteousness of God. If you would just begin to play something softly back there. We are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. Why? Because our broken hearts have been reconciled to wholeness. Our poverty has been reconciled into good news. Our imprisonment has been reconciled into freedom. If that is not the case, there is an invitation to be reconciled. It's not that you're not saved. It's not that you're not born again. It's not that you don't love God. The question has to be answered in a very real and a very transparent manner. Is there a little bit of poverty in you? Is there a little bit of brokenheartedness in you? Even a little bit. Is there a little bit of bondage in you? Is a piece of you still feel like it's been trapped by something? Is there... A little bit 
of heaviness in you? Is there a little bit of ashes in the way you see? Is there a little bit of ashes in your life? Is there a little bit of mourning in you? Jesus said, the eye is the lamp of the body. If the eye be single, the whole body will be full of light. But if there is even a little bit of darkness in your eye, how great is that darkness within you? What is he saying? If there's areas that you're not willing to be transparent, then what is really on the inside of who you are? Tonight, I'm talking about the stuff that you don't want anybody to know about. The stuff you're unwilling to look at. The, the little bit of brokenness. You have to come out of hiding and step into the light and realize that if any of those things that I just named are on the inside of you, you have all you need to make the exchange. The gospel is an invitation to be reconciled to Him. And even in the best Christians, there has to be continual reconciliation. I want you all to stand to your feet. going to take our time in this place tonight. We're not in a hurry. It's not even as late as I expected it to be. We're going we're gonna to go in a lot of places tonight, if, if you'll go with me. Um, because God is looking ultimately for people to be his ambassadors people to operate in the anointing to make an exchange for people. For someone to possess a whole heart to give to someone who has a broken heart. He's looking for people who can say, what I do have, I give to you. But before we can even get there, says the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. His anointing is over me to bring good news to the poor, to bind up broken hearts, to bring liberty to those in captivity, to open the prison doors to those who are bound, to comfort all who mourn, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning, instead of pain. The garment of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness. That they may be called oaks of righteousness. I want you all to close your eyes. I want you to look through the, the facade and see clearly what is on the inside of you. Is there poverty in you? You don't have to be identified as poor to have a little bit of poor in you. Is there a broken heart in you? Is there a little bit of bondage in you?
Is there a little bit of ashes? Could be a lot. It doesn't matter how much. You just know that Jesus wants to give you an exchange. If you're in this place and you identify with any of those things, an exchange is available. have a little bit of broken heart. There is a whole heart available. And so if you're here and you say, if I'm willing to be honest with myself, some of that is still in me. It takes courage. It takes honesty. But it is the best awakening to reality that you will ever do. So if you're in this place and you need to make an exchange, I'm going to invite you to the altar right now. You can kneel, you can stand. You just say, Jesus, I'm coming to you. Don't even wait on prayer. We'll, we'll shift into ministry in, in a little while here. I want to give all of those who are up here an opportunity. For broken hearts to be mended. For heaviness to be exchanged for real praise. For pain to be exchanged to the oil of joy. Jesus is here. And I implore you. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. Let Him have you. Let Him have your ashes. See, see His nail-pierced hands reaching for ashes with a crown of beauty in the other hand. Make the exchange. As long as it takes, don't leave this altar until the exchange is made. Even if it takes all night, don't leave this place with your heart not healed. Don't leave this place with ashes. Holy Spirit, come. If you're not at the altar, I'm just going to ask if you just begin to pray. Just pray, bless the Lord. Worship in spirit and in truth. This is a holy moment. whole hearts, not broken hearts. Beauty instead of ashes. Joy instead of mourning. Praise for a spirit of heaviness. Good news instead of poverty. Activity. If you're at this altar, just begin to receive what he has for you. The song says, I trade my ashes 
in for beauty and I wear forgiveness like a crown. Cast your burdens on the Lord for He cares for you. distraction to set in, make the exchange. Thank you. 